Hi guys, um, Mayur here. Um, I guess it's time. So, Arshi, you there? Good evening, sir. Yes, I'm here. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Thank you all for joining. Thank you so much, sir. We have much to learn from you. And the floor is yours when you're ready. I'm all set. Um, all ready to go. It's a Sunday. I'm sure everybody uh, would be wanting to carry on with what they want to do. <laughs> yes, sir. Yep. So let me know when I can start. Hi, uh, I am Dr. Mayur Dauda, and uh, I love to speak on telephotography and documentation. I'm here on Aroshi's Dental Club um, so that I can help you uh, know a little bit of dental photography. Uh, but before I jump into dental photography and a couple of my cases, um, I am going to be introducing myself uh, to you guys. All right, so I am a Mayur. I am, I am, I am, I am. for Canon uh, and I'm sure everybody knows Canon is a company that makes cameras, lenses and flashes. I'm also the resource person for the world's longest running program on dental photography at Manipal College of Dental Sciences in their Manipal campus and I'm, I'm sure that you all know Manipal. MCOT has two campuses, one is in Mangalore, one is in Manipal. So the world's largest program on dental photography actually happens in the Manipal campus. It's a, it's a three month long program. And I don't believe that there is any course in the world that is as elaborate as the IDPC or the Integrated Dental Photography course. I love to do uh, high speed liquid splash photography and you can, as you can see, I'm a tech geek. I love technology i love to invest on equipments games um and a lot more cool stuff so right now the music that you can hear is actually through my mixer that's because i've been a dj as well um i also have a couple of podcasts by the name of podcast at 32 minute um so 32 minute is is my podcast and uh, I actually invite other people to speak on my podcast about dentistry. But not only dentistry, I call a lot of other talented people who are pursuing something else parallelly in dentistry, apart from dentistry, sorry. Um, and I also invite other people, like people who could be personal development people or investing uh, you know, people are helping who are helping us in investment and stuff like that. Uh, I also have a podcast by the name of Dental Photography School. And because I love pets, I love dogs, cats, I also have a podcast by the name of Pet Pepper App. So, and it's available on Apple, Google, Spotify, or any other platform of your choice, even on Ghana, actually. I am a YouTuber. Um, I, I love to put videos on dental photography and even general photography on YouTube. You can check out my channel called Dental Photography School. I have also authored chapters um, in intro photography or dental photography in a couple of textbooks, like um, in a proston textbook and also a textbook of dermatology. Um, so my recent publication was with Dr. Paula Pasquale. She's one of the best dermatologists of the world. And um, this book is published in Barcelona in Spain. So that's about me, but a little bit about my uh, journey now. Uh, so I hope you guys are still there after this boring introduction, but I obviously started off um, as a small guy. I was uh, an introvert. Just, just give me a second. Yeah, I'm back. Um, so you won't believe, I'm sure you won't believe that I was an introvert when I was in college, but that's how it was. I was. I, I rarely spoke to anyone. And uh, after graduating, I started my 
photography journey. So most of the people that know me today, um, so I'm friends with some of the best people in the industry, uh, both nationally as well as internationally. And people know me because I teach a lot of dental photography stuff. In fact, I was live on Instagram just five minutes back. I'm not really sure if uh, anybody of you were there. Uh, so, yeah, uh, if you want to know more about dental photography, you can connect with me on Clubhouse, Instagram. These are the two platforms that I'm routinely live on. Um, I don't know why, but I am not a very big fan of Facebook. I'm not really sure why I don't like Facebook. Although I'm very active on Facebook. I mean, my staff takes care of my Facebook. All right, so... Um, yeah, like I said, I started off with photography after I graduated, but obviously I did not start off with dental photography. I started off with general photography and I used to love taking pictures in the wild. So I started off with very basic things like taking pictures of flowers and butterflies. I actually recorded a lot of butterfly life cycles right from their egg, the larva, pupa and the adult butterfly. But later on, it diversified into a lot of other things. So um, I, I, I love taking pictures of macro photography. Like you can see, macro photography is close-up photography. And the reason why I probably went into macro photography because the equipment for macro wildlife photography and dental photography is the same. So obviously, that was, that was the best option for me that I could have used for general photography. Um, so while I was doing wildlife photography, I also had my clinic. Um, I did not uh, shadow anyone um, and I started my clinic directly. And that's one thing that I regret. I personally feel that all the students must shadow someone. Um, I mean, not, not a virtual shadowing. You have to go and um, observe somewhere and learn from them. That's, that's what I personally believe in. Uh, but unfortunately, I did not get that opportunity. Okay, so while I was doing wildlife photography, I also in entered into dental photography and I documented a lot of my cases. Uh, I forgot to tell you one thing. I graduated from Dr. D.Y. Patel University School of Dentistry and I'm a proud alumnus of that college. Um, that's in Mumbai, obviously. Um, and I finished my graduation in 2007 and I started working in my private practice since 2008. Um, so that was with my sister-in-law, but I, I actually started my own separate clinic in 2011. Um, so till that time, I was working in, in my sister-in-law's uh, clinic. But that also, it was not like a shadowing thing. I was actually doing my own cases. Um, all right. So coming back to my journey over here. Um, so yeah, these are the kind of pictures that I used to take, um, especially insects. I love uh, macro photography of insects. So these are a couple of things that kind of encouraged me to actually dive deeper into more wildlife than I went into ornithology. I, I take I started taking pictures of birds. In fact, I actually did a course on ornithology. That is a year long program on birding in which I had field trips and I used to go to Point Calimere. That's almost like the southernmost tip of India, very close to Sri Lanka. Have you guys seen Family Man by any chance? Um, in that, they actually mentioned this particular place called Point Karimir. It's a very famous place for bird migration. So I think somebody muted, unmuted themselves. So I think you might have seen Family Man. Have you guys seen Family Man? Or are you seeing Family Man? Yes, sir. Okay. So I think yes, Sakshi sir. said that. Okay. Have you finished watching Family Man? Or you guys are still watching it, or it was like long time back you saw Family Man. It's a long, long time, time back. So what are you guys watching these days? On Netflix or Amazon or whatever. Come on, you're 73 people and I'm not getting an answer. It's a big bang that TV. means you're watching something cheesy. Sorry, okay. I'm watching Okay. It. That's like an all time favorite of everyone, if I'm not wrong. Okay, cool guys. So I'm gonna carry on with my presentation. Where the hell is my presentation now? Gotta pick it back from down. All right. Yeah, so I did a one year long program on birding, um, wherein I actually recorded bird calls. 
and finally after doing so, so much of wildlife photography and getting published in lonely planet and and international magazines like that with such awesome photography somewhere i felt that my photography was unethical because if you want to take good macro pictures you have to go very close to these kind of subjects especially frogs like these and sometimes you have to handle them so obviously i'm not going to end up getting such a good picture if the frog was where it was i have to pick it up place it at a better place and then take a picture of the frog in a good lighting situation like in this case i've used a diffuse flash so uh handling is actually not considered that ethical because i'm not there to know more about that particular creature i'm just there to take a picture of it and i believe that we should stop doing this if it's just for a facebook live or an a facebook like or an instagram like because the people who should actually be handling these species should be the scientists and biodiversity people who have done their phd or trying to do research and not the photographers because as soon as i keep this frog back i'm sure it's in danger somebody's going to kill the frog so i shifted my complete attention to a completely different field like what you see on the screen um, i hope you can because i've been showing my screen since quite some time uh, can somebody confirm if you can see my screen i've already crossed 11 slides yes, sir. awesome yes sir so i shifted my focus completely to uh, liquid splash photography uh, as you can see on the screen right now and i specialize in taking pictures of water splashes so what do i do in this is i put a drop of water in a bowl of water a jet comes out that's actually called as the bottom of jet when it reaches the maximum height i put another drop of water when they both collide with each other is when i take a picture so i actually got like i actually deep dive deep dived into this particular form of photography it was very addictive and i could i could get one decent picture in one month initially but i did get it um, but there was no looking back because i really enjoyed getting different different forms of splashes uh so because of this i got an opportunity to get uh, interviewed by one of the biggest photography magazines of india by the name of beta photography uh, how many of you know this particular magazine uh, anybody has heard of beta photography um because it, it is India's number one photography magazine. Anybody in the audience has heard of this magazine? No, I guess. Cool. So I was interviewed by them, and uh, I was on the cover shot of this magazine. And at this point of time, I realized that I can do a bit more. Then I exhibited my artwork at the Jahangir Art Gallery. So if people are from Bombay, any Bombay people in the house, uh, guys? Anyone? Bombay people. Damn, there's nobody from Bombay. Seriously? Come on. Where are you guys from? Most of you are from which city? Okay. Delhi. From Bombay. Everybody is from Delhi. Who is from Bombay? I want to see who is from Bombay. From me. Heer. Heer Shah is from Mumbai. I think I I got. Uh, comments like nagpur andabad mangalore so who is from mangalore like, i want to come to goa so gulen is from goa bombay aisha sayed is from bombay bhumi is from gujarat riha is from assam assam is such a beautiful place i got my first uh, rhino sighting obviously in assam i can see a lot of people currently in manipur nice so maybe you can maybe we can we can catch up and i'm doing the integrated in photography course a lot of people are from bombay so you do, do you guys know of kalagod art festival and the jahangir art gallery by any chance yes because, sir because yeah i happen to exhibit my work over there guys typing is a little boring i would not mind if you can actually unmute yourself and answer because it's really difficult for me to read all the comments but if you unmute yourself make a chaos that's a little better So if everybody says yes or no or whatever they want to input on by unmuting yourself, you're more than welcome. Or maybe you can even put your videos on if you're comfortable. All right. So let me jump back. So what I did was um, I exhibited at the Kalagod Art Festival and the Jahangir Art Gallery. And at that point of time, I realized that uh, I do have the capacity to probably start teaching my colleagues about dental photography because I had done so many mistakes by then. 
in reaching this particular stage of my life that I was very confident ki abhi koi mistake kar raha hai baki nahi hai and that is why I started uh, teaching dental photography because I had been there done that and all kinds of mistakes were already done by me and I was very sure if anybody has any question about photography in general or even dental photography I'll be more than confident to answer it so that's how my journey in dental photography started obviously my clinic was on parallelly at this point of time as well and she is one of the most beautiful subjects that I got to take a picture of she is the daughter of uh, one of the most famous dentists in India very beautiful eyes do you agree guys such beautiful innocent eyes that I had not seen before but right so yeah this is my podcast uh, it's it's on apple dental photography school maybe you can check it out later but i'm now going to tell you a little bit about dental photography and bore you a little bit more so i'm going to be telling you what is dental photography why it's important for you as a student and maybe even when you start your private practice or maybe go abroad how you can pursue it and what should be the kind of equipment settings um i'm not going to go deeper into settings or standardization because i think uh, you all are uh, maybe in your first year second year third year or final year i'm not really sure all right so what is dental photography uh, it's basically anything that you might have taken a picture of I'm, and i'm sure that you have done dental photography before so if you've taken a picture of your patient's face you've done dental photography if you've taken a picture of a patient smile or even your friend's close up smile you have done dental photography if you've taken a picture of an instrument you have done dental photography if you've done taken a picture of a toothpaste it's still dental photography but a little bit of marketing or a commercial type of dental photography if you've taken a picture of an opg and iop film it is still dental photography um and if you've taken a picture with your patient it is also dental photography so dental photography could be in many forms and i'm sure you might have might have tried it uh, many a times i remember when i was doing my pre clinical work in in the first year or, or second year i used to take pictures of whatever i used to do even that is dental photography uh, but one question to the audience uh, over here have you taken pictures of your dad slide through the microscope or just slide type photo liya kyunki pata hai ye slide aane wala hai have you taken a picture of that no, let's let's be honest yes. have you taken a picture yes, of that yes sir all yes, the time microscope yes. se microscope so, ke andar se liya ya slide ka bahar se liya ye sat sat bata do microscope ke andar se ये रिया तो रिया तो झूठ बोल रही है क्योंकि मैं स्लाइड फोटोज बाहर से लेता था स्लाइड जो भी होती थी वो कटी हुई होती थी कहीं ना कहीं से और स्लाइड देख के मुझे पता चल जाता कि भैया ये कौन सी स्लाइड है मैं माइक्रोस्कोप के अंदर देख के डिसाइड नहीं करता था कि ये क्या है स्पेसिमेन क्या है हां बट आई वाज आई वाज अ वेरी डम स्टूडेंट इन माय कॉलेज डे और इनफैक्ट आई नेवर इवन वांटेड डेंटिस्ट्री आई आई सो आई came into dentistry out of pure pressure because my brother is a very dedicated clinician uh, he is not a dentist he is an ophthalmologist so uh, people who are in bombay must be knowing this that kgm is probably india's best college to pursue medicine so mera bhai jab main 10th standard mein tha bhaiya mera kgm mein he was in kgm and he was pursuing mbbs so i was like are yaar my family is going to be behind me but i'll also have to pursue medicine now and then that he got into aims and after he got into aims there was no scope for me i had to do something related to medicine so when he was in aims i was in 12th and um, i gave my entrance exam and then i i got a good rank uh, atchwood and then i was like bhaiya mujhe mbbs dental kuch nahi karna hai mere ko physiotherapy karna hai kyunki mujhe padhna nahi hai the problem with me was uh, as soon as i start reading something i fall asleep I'm not really sure why why that happens, but maybe because it's a little too boring for me. But this is the truth, and I never wanted to pursue dentistry. I wanted to pursue physiotherapy because I used to think uh, we have to study less in physiotherapy. I'm not really sure if that was true or not, but but I was not a bright student, and I'm still not a bright student um, when it comes to reading books. But I love to pick up information from a video, audio podcast, or even um, going through somebody's case. That's that's how I learn. uh myself i'm not a very big fan of reading meri zindagi mein maine ek hi book padhi hai novel nahi ek nahi do actually one is davinci code and one is the alchemist usme bhi alchemist mujhe bahut zyada boring lagi 
and I'm sure people are going to kill me after hearing this that Alchemist मुझे boring लगी. Um, so my favorite was the Da Vinci Code. Apart from that, I'm trying to read uh, a lot of books now, but I'm not able to complete it. I'm not really sure if um, you guys are able to read so much. Um, the current book that I'm reading is Iki Guy, and uh, I'm not able to finish it because I feel that it's very repetitive. All right, so coming back to my session, why dental photography is important? It's because as a clinician, you can grow your practice by marketing it. You can build transparency between your patients. You you can publish your particular cases. Uh, if you've taken a good picture, you can get published in an oral pathology textbook or a DADS textbook. If you've done good clinical cases, it is going to get published in journals. So it's very important for publications. Apart from that, you can do self-analysis, educate your patient. If you've heard of forensic odontology, I'm sure you had a session on it recently. Uh, it's very important in forensics as well. And of course, for your social media presence and educating your colleagues as well as students uh, in the form of webinars. Um, all in all, dental photography has more than 50 applications in dentistry, so don't underestimate it. All right, so um, with the same equipment of dental photography, you can also pursue general photography. Like you can take great portraits, a beautiful uh, wildlife macro photography, and a lot of other things. Okay. So one of the most frequently asked questions by me, by most of the students is, if you are to pursue dental photography, what should be your equipment be lent? Uh, so these are a couple of checklist eight points that you should have in the photography equipment if you're planning to purchase something about for dental photography. Obviously, number one, you should have a high resolution. It should exactly replicate what's present in front of you. There should be no distortion, no noise. You should get sharp pictures and recurrently similar pictures. This is one problem that I see in a lot of Indian speakers that the pictures are not recurrent. The pictures keep on changing the exposure in the sense that the brightness is not same in pre or post op, and the colors are also different in pre or post op. So, um, in dental photography, we want recurrently similar pictures. Okay, it should be easy to use and it should be economic. So, these are eight checklists that, that should be there in your dental photography equipment, and there are two ways in which you can do dental photography, obviously. One is with the help of your phone and one is with the help of a uh, professional camera. So I obviously am a big fan of professional cameras. And these are a couple of challenges and advantages of using your phone as compared to a professional DSLR. I'm not going to deep dive into it, but uh, the main reason why I don't prefer phones is you get a lot of distortion. So the image on the left and the image on the right is basically the same patient. That's the patient X. Um, that's, that's my typhoidon. And if you take a picture with a phone, the patient's arch form, it, it, it looks distorted as compared to a DSLR and a 100mm macro lens. That's the lens that we probably want to use for dental photography. Um, another reason why I don't like phones is because the depth of field or the area of sharpness is very, very less as compared to a DSLR. Um, what I mean by that is if I'm taking a picture with a phone, probably a small area like lateral to lateral might be sharp, but in a DSLR, I can actually control this depth. It's, it's actually called as the depth of field. And I can get everything in sharp if I want. I can also get Instagram type of pictures in which I have a background bouquet effect. So uh, I'm obviously not going to deep dive into uh, the settings and technicalities of dental photography. But if you're interested, you can check out my YouTube channel, which has a particular video on um, the settings that we use for dental photography. So how does one go ahead and buy equipment for dental photography? A lot of people think that buying a good camera is the best thing for dental photography, but that's not true. Uh, so there is a concept called the reverse concept. And if you understand the reverse concept, you can invest nicely on the equipment. And the concept goes like this. You have to invest maximum on different, different flash systems because in photography, in photography, light is the most important thing. And in dental photography, the light source is your flash. So invest on different, different flash systems. Invest a good amount on a lens and invest the minimum on the camera and not the other way around. Most of the people think camera zyada manga le liya to photo achha aenge. That's not true. You have to invest more on the flash, medium on the lens and minimum on the camera. That's, that's how we go about uh, deciding the equipment for dental photography. 
So buy any camera that you like, which fits your budget, but it should have four things. One is it should be an interchangeable lens camera in the sense, if I want to insert a macro lens for dental photography, you should be able to do that. Okay. Um, I'm sorry for skipping the slide, but yeah, these are the four requirements. You should be able to put any lens of your choice. It should be able to accept different, different flash. For example, I use a Canon camera. I am a big fan of Canon cameras, but I should be able to put a Yongnu or so that's a company that makes flashes onto my Canon camera. A lot of cameras don't allow that. So make sure that, that you can use different, different company car flashes on your Canon camera or Nikon or whatever you have. It should have Wi-Fi so that I can easily transfer the files onto my phone or onto my TV when I'm doing a consultation. So what I do in my clinic is as soon as I take a picture on my camera, I show it on a bigger screen like a TV so that they can easily see what kind of work that I'm doing inside their mouth live. That's the best part of having Wi-Fi in your camera. And obviously, your camera should be light and bright. We all know that in, in dentistry, one of the occupational hazards is cervical spondylitis. Now, when it comes to cameras, I've already cleared it, but there's only one lens that we use for lens photography. You need to have this lens. It's called as a 100mm macro lens. So it's, it's there in Canon, Nikon, or whatever company that you wish to have. But just a word of caution, don't, don't try to do dental photography with this lens. This is not a macro lens. This is a zoom lens. You can see there are two numbers written on the bottom of the lens. That's 55 to 50. This is a telephoto zoom lens and it cannot be used. We have to use a lens which has a single number and it is a macro lens. So there's not a macro lens. Uh, however, um, this is a macro lens. You can see 100. There's only one number and macro is also written on it. So we, we prefer to use this lens as compared to other lenses. Now, uh, what are the flashes that we used? If, if you were there on my Instagram live that I just did five minutes back, a couple of minutes back, I'm sorry. Um, we, I was showing, actually, I was actually showing this particular flash. It's called as a ring and flash. So in most of the dental photography, people use ring flashes for documenting their cases. But there are other flashes also. For example, this is a twin flash. So these two flashes are very, very popular amongst dentists. And you can choose whatever you like. What is the difference between the two? So if I'm taking a picture of a patient like this, you can see on the left-hand side, I the, the reflection areas are very well contained only on the cervical aspect on the line angles. So I can control the amount of reflections with the twin flash. But a ring flash, the light is just in front of the subject and I get a lot of hot spots. What is the hot spot? It's, it's a bright white area which has no details in it. So for aesthetic cases, we use twin flashes, uh, preferably, preferably we, we, we do that. Um, if you're planning to buy all this equipment, just be careful. Don't buy this. This is not a ring flash. As you can see, there are um, very, very small bulbs in it. It's, it's not a ring flash. It's called as a ring light. So if you're planning to buy a ring flash, consult someone who's more experienced and then buy a ring flash. Because if you go abroad, um, these equipments are a must to have. You need to have a camera, lens, and a flash. Okay. So in, in, in a nutshell, um, there are a lot of equipments that are available. Uh, for dental photography, maybe you can take a screenshot of this. These are a couple of recommended equipments on the left hand side. And on the right hand corner, uh, there are a couple of equipments that I don't recommend. So if, if you're on Facebook, maybe you can join this private Facebook group called Dental Photography School and you'll get more information about the equipment. And of course, also on my YouTube channel in which I've, I've shown live as to how you can use this equipment creatively. Uh, but apart from all this equipment, there's one equipment that's most important and that is um, underestimated. It's the mirrors and something called as contrasters. So actually, I would probably want to show you what is a contrastor before I go into the intro accessories. So in this particular image, I have got a black background behind the teeth and that's not photoshopped. Okay. So how do we get a black background is with the help of something called as contrastors. So they are essentially black color, um, stainless steel coated um, accessories that you can put inside the patient's mouth after you autoclave them. So you can see the white color things over here are the mirrors and the black color things are the contrasters. So you need to have everything so that you can document your cases nicely. Um, usually everything is separately available, but um, 
Just to make it simple for the demo, this what I did was I put everything together. I actually manufacture them and put them all in a box called as a magic box, which is also of course available uh, on my website. That's dentalphotographyschool.in. So if you want to document your cases nicely, irrespective if it's a camera, a professional camera, or a phone, um, I would say that more than the camera or the lens, the internal accessories are more important because you cannot just do all kinds of uh, pictures with just one set of cheek retractors. You need to have different different uh, shapes of cheek retractors, different shapes of mirrors, uh, and even contrasters. So everything is there in, in a magic box. Uh, if you probably want to invest on this maybe maybe you can order it sometime in future because i'm not really sure if you're actually doing dental photography at this point of time in your life all right so i'm going to be diving into a couple of my cases so what i actually mean by uh, the pre or post-op cases should look similar uh, with respect to the pictures is exactly this so as you can see the pre-operative it's it's um one six and there's a cavity in the distal pit um and every picture has the same amount of image brightness, same color, and even the same composition. So if you want to achieve this, you have to have a professional camera, but it's not that you cannot manage with a phone, you can, it's just, you're gonna be ending up spending more time. Uh, but you need to have the right intraoral accessories for this. So the key, so the key to good dental photography is actually consistency is the most important thing so this is the first case that i probably wanted to show it to you um I've, i'm starting off with something very very basic uh, but uh, i think uh, this is equally as exciting as complicated cases because there is a challenge in everything and i like to work very clean and neat and um, i don't work with uh, uh, i don't work uh, uh, carelessly i love to use rubber dam in all my cases whether it's a class one restoration class two, class three, or any kind of a restoration. Everything rubber dam is required. And uh, I hope that one day they start teaching rubber dams in UG as well. Um, are they teaching you rubber dams in UG right now? Anyone? Yes, sir. Okay, so what do you know about rubber dams? Guys? Procedure and the parts. No, no, have you used it practically? No, sir. No, sir. Parts, parts, so there are the common, but maybe you should use it so that you have um, an experience with it. Maybe what you can do is you can obviously use it on a typhodon, right? Have you used it on typhodons? No, sir. No, sir. So, what I would suggest is if um, college, mein hai, so use karke dekho because it's very exciting and 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 initially it's not easy but later on it it does become easy but uh, it's it's a lot of fun to use a rubber dam try using rubber dams um as you can see i love uh, pink color rubber dam sheets a lot because it it looks very clean and neat so um how deep do you want me to discuss this particular case, Arushi? Uh, because I have five cases, but uh, like, uh, how do you want me to discuss it? Like, do I tell step by step what I have done? How how do you guys discuss it? So it's on you. I mean, we just want to don't we don't don't want to cross the one hour limit. Otherwise, it's on you. Well, yeah, I think uh, we are half an hour into the session. It's yes, eight sir. three now. Yes, sir. Mm, awesome. All right, so let me jump back. So yeah, this is a simple class one restoration. You can use any burr. Uh, it's, it's obviously done with an A-rotor, but I'm not really sure if you guys use A-rotors right now. Um, I think in third year and final year, people use quadrangle hand pieces, but I'm not really sure about this right now, how it is. So the green color thing, can anybody tell me what is the green color pigment? Uh, guys, yeah, yeah. So always try to use a caries detecting dye um, uh, so that you can be double sure whether you are leaving any caries behind. So after the caries detection dye, you have to acid etch. So obviously there's a composite restoration. Um, so you've got to do acid etching, bonding, and then put a little bit of flow in the bottom of the cavity and then actually start, love to build it up with a free hand because I love 
uh, dental anatomy and morphology. So I do everything with a free hand. Um, I give it a lot of time when I'm doing this cases, but ultimately we do end up getting a good result post-operatively. Um, one thing that is, is of most important, most importance in this particular case is you have to check occlusion nicely with the help of an articulating paper. So the blue color marks that you see, they are actually articulating marks. They should be there at the desired spot. So since this is a maxillary uh, uh, tooth, we want articulating point marks on the palatal aspects and on the mesial marginal ridge, but my cavity was actually not there it, at all. So it's completely fine not to have uh, a lot of articulating marks on the place where I've actually done the cavity. So did not require a lot of trimming, but if I would have got a mark over there, I would have been, I would have trimmed it a little bit, but this turned out to be a great result uh, after um, the particular uh, restoration. I was very happy with it. And uh, you can see the follow-up image after, uh, I think it was around after six months. It's, it's pretty good as well. That was the first case and now coming to class two restoration. This was a very challenging case. Um, as you can see, there's a huge cavity in uh, two sinks. Uh, I actually thought this is a root canal case. Um, so what I tell my patients, and you should also say that to your patients is, okay, guy, uh, uh, okay, um, so whatever is the patient's name, um, I am going to try and attempt a filling, but there is a high chance that it might go into a root canal treatment. Uh, but irrespective of if it's a filling or a root canal, you have to do something called as a pre-endodontic buildup. So any which ways you have to do a cavity preparation and fill it up um, even before you start a root canal. So I started off with this case thinking that uh, it might go into a root canal, but you can see after the caries excavation, there was no uh, pulpal exposure. There's no bleeding. So I used a uh, uh, caries indicator dye. After that, I cleared the entire cavity. Uh, I was very, very close to the pulp, but since there was no bleeding, I went ahead and did a class two restoration with a composite after putting a little bit of pulp capping agent on the bottom of the cavity. Uh, I'm sure you know what is a dressing uh, or an indirect pulp capping. Um, it, it has to be done when you are very close to the pulp. Um, you can see the clamps in this particular situation as compared to the previous clamps. Um, this is also very interesting, actually, if you want to deep dive. You can see the clamp over here. Clamp is that silver aluminum kind of a looking thing that's holding onto the tooth. I'm sure you know that. Um, so this clamp is not a toothed clamp, but this one you can see this is a toothed clamp. This is a tiger clamp and it's going to be holding on very firmly to your tooth and this is what was required for this particular case because it's a very, very big cavity. And you want a clamp that's going to hold on tight a little bit cervically and not give up or not slide off. So you need to use clamps very, very. Uh, you need to check it patiently and then decide which is the right clamp for you. Always have a clear rubber dam isolation because you will be able to enjoy your work uh, much more efficiently. Right, so... Um, this is about this case. Uh, what I'm going to do is probably I'm going to put my video off because I'm going to focus on my presentation only right now. I hope that's fine. Yes, sir. No worries. Okay. Just give me a second. Yeah, so this was the case number two. Uh, can somebody tell me what is the yellow color thing that is there uh, on the mesial side of the first tree? Anyone? Can I see something yellow color on the mesial side of the first tree? Initial case. No, I'm talking about the yellow or rubber kind of a thing. It's looking like Sev Gatia. If you're a Gujarati, you might be... You can see the yellow color thing in, on the mesial side of the first tree model. It's, it's like a thick rubber, uh, rubber band. 
before doing any kind of treatment uh, or and thinking about salvaging it, uh, saving it, I thought maybe I should get a CBCT or a CT scan done. Um, so when I got the CT scan done, there were multiple perforations. So the earlier dentist who had uh, tried and attempted a root canal, he had perforated this particular tooth at many, many places. So the entire um, treatment plan became very complicated, but the patient wanted to save this particular tooth. So what we did was we removed all the earlier root canal and we saw that there are multiple perforations. And you can also see that I have done a gingivectomy um, with the help of uh, uh, an electrocautery because the restoration was not only a class two uh, design cavity, but also it was sub -gingival. So I had to build it up and then I had to go ahead and block the perforation. So you have to block these perforations with the help of a material called as MDA. And after blocking the perforations, I had to remove the old root canal and give it a new uh, 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 root canal, give it a new obturation. You can see MDA as well as GP as well. And this is the actual case summary. So a tooth which is almost going to get extracted, um, but sometimes the patients also want to save it. You can save it with the help of MTA nowadays. Um, this was a very difficult case, but the patient was already warned that the prognosis might be questionable. But as of date, even after five years of doing this, I see this patient on a regular follow-up and the tooth is doing absolutely fantastic. And this is the tooth exactly behind it. So what I did was I gave it a temporary crown, the earlier tooth, I gave it a temporary crown and I started doing uh, the tooth which is behind, which also required a root canal treatment. And this is the before and after of this particular case. And then we went ahead and instead of giving a crown, uh, we went for a more conservative approach and gave it an only instead of uh, instead of uh, a routine crown. So, so the six actually has something called as an Emax only. It's, it's not a full crown. It's, it's just like a tabletop kind of a prosthesis. And even in the seven, I went ahead and I gave an inlay. Uh, right now, I don't think I have put that inlay picture in this presentation. Uh, coming to something more fancy now, uh, this is the last case that I probably want to show and bore you all with. Um, this particular patient wanted a smile design and you can, if you, if you actually see the close-up smile pictures closely, the patient has a lateral incisor missing. In fact, lateral incisor was missing on both the sides. Uh, there was a primary lateral incisor on the right hand side of the patient and it was converted to look like a permanent lateral incisor, but the lateral incisor was missing on both the sides, especially on the left-hand side, you can see after the central incisor, we directly have the canine. So this is a smile designing case in which uh, on the lateral, we had to uh, actually, on the right-hand side lateral, we had to extract and give a crown and, or a bridge. And on the left-hand side, we had to convert the canine to look like a lateral incisor. And the premolar had to be made such that it looks like a canine. So very interesting case, very challenging, but the patient was very, very happy with the post-operative result. As you can see in the full face pictures, the pre-op, post-op, the smile is very nice, very confident. These are all uh, Emax veneers, Emax crowns, and Emax bridge as well. Emax is lith uh, lithium disilicate. So um, this is a metal-free uh, restoration. Very, very popular in um, India and even abroad. Um, it's, it's considered as the gold standard for aesthetic dentistry. So this is the close-up of before and after pictures. You can see the frontal and the lateral views on both the sides. Uh, you have to bond them adequately. So even while bonding, you want a good rubber dam isolation. Looking at the post-operator pictures, you won't believe that the canine was actually converted to a premolar and the premolar was actually converted to a canine. And this is the full arch occlusal view of this particular case before and after. Okay, so smile designing cases, um, they are really, really uh, good to see and the patient is very, very happy. 
and you can end up doing a lot of uh, glamour dental photography like this actually and the case looks stunning and the best part is the patient is very 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 happy after you give them such a result so this patient is actually not from india so i had very limited time uh, but obviously i wanted to do an implant first but instead of an implant we had to uh, compromise with a bridge so uh, these are the five cases that uh, actually wanted to show you guys um so a lot can be done in dentistry if you are actually passionate about it and a lot you can do in dental photography as well so these are some dental pictures that you can do with the same lens and the camera that you had used for close up macro photography um i kind of have reduced taking pictures like these but it's a lot of fun if you're good at makeup actually if if somebody is good at makeup make real photography but it can be at a completely different level actually so i i'm just hoping that these images would inspire you someday to take up dental photography these are um, routinely done uh, in my courses actually uh, these are not my patients obviously but uh, when i teach dental photography people also want to learn glamour part so a lot of dentists are getting into glamour dental photography now all right so uh, i have a course online called dental photography simplified um, you can actually attend this course irrespective if you are in first year or final year of graduation and it's available online um, it's it's on teachable.com it's like a netflix subscription um you can go ahead and learn dental photography online watch the videos at your own convenience and uh, be great at dental photography whenever you are entering into your clinical practice if you would want to connect with me on instagram that's my instagram handle it's for canon photo mentor i'm pretty active on clubhouse if you want to join me on clubhouse i've got two clubs over there Uh, one by the name of dental photography school and one by the name of dentistry at 32 minute you can listen to all the podcast on 32 minute it uh, i have podcast on endodontics prosthodontics restorative dentistry and multiple other topics on 32 minute and dental photography school of course is for uh, dental photography only uh, if you are interested to join the telegram group called dental photography school i would love to include you in that I probably share the link. In fact, the link is actually there on my Instagram. Um on my Instagram there's a link tree link uh, where you will be able to join each and everything that's mentioned over here. So, so maybe you can just follow me on Instagram and you can get access to all the links from my link in bio. Uh and LinkedIn, I'm not really sure if you guys are on LinkedIn. Uh as of now. Uh I think the youngsters might not be on LinkedIn right now. All right, so coming back uh, so that's that's about me uh, that's what i have to share with all of you guys if you have any questions i would love to take it now anyone uh guys do you have any questions uh, if you, if you don't have any questions i would call it day and i'd probably love to connect with you sometime in future Sir, before you go, I would just like to ask you that what advice would you give to your undergraduate self? Uh, I should have started dental photography earlier when I had not yet finished uh, my graduation. I should have started it probably I was when I was in first year itself, because the later that I would have started, the later I would have reached at this point of time. So maybe I would have been more popular. um if i would have started in photography before itself that is one thing i would have loved to tell myself if i might met myself in time before uh if you have any questions yeah. maybe you can unmute yourself and 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 ask me the questions directly so so we have so sakshi hanji yes. do you want to ask 
Uh, sir, how do we get our patients to bear with us when clicking photographs at every step of the procedure? Uh, they don't have a choice, very honestly. You don't have to give them a choice. You have to tell them that this is how I do my practice. And if, if they're not comfortable with it, you can always tell them that there is, there is another dentist next door and probably you can go to that particular dentist. But uh, none of my patients have objected in me taking so many pictures till now. I usually take, for a smile designing case, I, I take close to 100 pictures. Um, that, that includes pre-operative, operative, and post-operative, but none of them have said that I'm tired of you taking pictures. That's that's never happened. In fact, I keep appointments specially for photography and they totally respect that. So uh, we don't have to, uh, the patients don't have to bear with us. That's that's how we work. We, we don't give them an option because everything has to be documented. And the most important thing is you have to give them those pictures and they are very happy to see those pictures because they, uh, they can appreciate that you're being very transparent with them rather than saying something else and doing something else. Hope that answers. Yes, sir. All right, so who is next? So I have a question. Yep. T tell me your name and then go ahead and ask your question. Uh, yes, sir. So my name is Heer and uh, I am asking this question with respect to so many dental professionals uploading their pictures on social media like Instagram or Facebook. So uh, how do you um, protect or copyright your work? Like except for the watermark that we see. What are the ways? No, you can't do anything because um, you have to watermark your pictures. That's the only thing that you can do. Uh, but if it comes to cases and if you think that there's a fraud going on, you can always uh, go to court and sue that particular dentist. If that particular dentist is saying that the case was done by them, but it was actually done by you. So when you go to the court, um, the court will be able to decide who has actually done that case. But uh, there's no way to protect your content online. Everything on uh, online can be stolen. Everything. So you have to be a little careful with that. Even if you watermark, I can remove the watermark easily. Um, it's just that uh, you should be able to prove that it's your case. And if, if you want to prove that, you should start taking pictures in raw format. If you want to know what is raw format, you can check out my podcast or my YouTube channel. Okay, sir. Thank you. Good question, Heer and Sakshi, both of you. Right, so any more questions or should I call it day? Guys. Do we have more questions or can I go ahead and call it day? I wanted to ask a question. My name is Ria. Yeah, Ria, go ahead. So in a case, you told us that you do the gingerex tummy if the like purple stone is not there to, yeah. for the uh, cavity preparation. If the rubber dam is above the purple floor, we do the gingerex tummy. Yeah. So, so how do you convince the patient? Because then like the patient came for a... You don't have to con You don't have to convince. You have to tell them that, boss, if you want a treatment which is satisfactory, I cannot go ahead. Because uh, very honestly, you should have ideally guessed it. So when, when I had actually started that case only, I had told, I had given an idea that there is a possibility that when I remove the silver filling, I might also have to cut the gums, but I cannot be sure. I'll tell you only when I'm doing it. Um, so you have to mentally prepare. So that's one thing that you can do. But even when you are doing, you, you, you cannot do anything. You have to say that um, the cavity has become very deep. It's, it's much more deeper than what I had expected. And if you want a fruitful result, uh, I have only one more option to do. That's either go ahead with a gingivectomy and uh, give you a filling. Uh, but if you're not ready, then I can just stop over here and you can just pay me whatever it is. I am. Uh, you can pay me for what I have done so far. But uh, without a gingivectomy, I cannot give you a good result. Uh, you have to be very clear from your side. It's, it's not that, uh, I mean, you're not doing anything wrong. You're not uh, cheating on the patient. It's just that it happened that way. Uh, maybe it was not predictable. So either the patient has to understand. If the patient does not understand, they have to pay you for what whatever you have done. Okay, you can always sir. give them a temporary. They can go to some other dentist if, if they don't trust you. Okay, but sir. at least you should not do something that's wrong. You should, should if, if gingivectomy was required, 
you sh you cannot just go ahead with a filling without the gingivectomy. You have to do what you think is right. Okay, sir. Fine. Sir, and if, if I want to enroll for this dental photography course, so how should I proceed? Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to quickly put a link on the chat. Uh, you can just click on that particular link. Uh, that link has everything. It has linked to my Instagram, my clubhouse, even my online course. Um, it's just link tree, Mayur Davda. Um, you can go ahead and uh, you can join the course over there. Anybody's welcome to join the course over there. All right, so any more questions? Um, would anybody want to unmute themselves and ask a question? Yeah, Mayur, sir, can I ask one question? This is Dr. Gaurav. Gaurav. Yeah. No need to call me Mayur sir and all. Mayur is completely fine. Gaurav, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, uh, sir, do you go uh, go about like um, obtaining some written informed consent from the patient and before recording this uh, clinical pictures or whatever? Is it is it like so, necessary? Yeah, it's 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 not necessary. It's compulsory. Uh, my basic consent form itself that the treatment I'm going to be doing so and so so and so that has it written in the consent form itself that. I will be recording the entire case and it might be shared for educational and marketing purposes and the patient has to sign it. So even if it is not a part of like a research paper or something, if we are recording any picture, the informed consent thing is mandatory. Yes, because if I put it on social media, I have to have consent. Okay, so it's always better to uh, have it's not better. Return. It's 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 a norm. You have to take a consent. It's not better. You don't have an option. You have to have a consent. So thank you. Sir. Just Excellent make it like one line that I am going to document and I'm going to use it. You have to have that sign. Thank you, sir. Your presentation was excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Gaurav. Um, it was my pleasure. I hope you guys enjoyed. Any more questions? There's one more question in the comments. But I'll appreciate if they can unmute it themselves when asking this. Uh, so I guess there's nothing left to answer then. Should I call it day? Sir, I think there are no more questions. Okay. Acha, I think did someone uh, unmute Malika or? Arora if I'm not wrong. There's one more question by Kostav Kar. But I would appreciate if they can unmute themselves and answer and question question this. Uh, so am I audible? Yeah, wish Masai. Yes, sir. Uh, sir, you mentioned that uh, you would have. Uh, it would have been nice if you would have started dental photography in first year. So, would you advise like us undergraduates to invest in that whole photography, you know, gear, gear whatever uh, instruments that we need for dental photography, you know, irrespective of our uh, study year. Or like I would not insist, but yeah, if you have it, it becomes much more easier, right? If if I say if I'm starting my clinical work in my third year, so third year me if I buy a camera, I have additional headache of learning the camera in third year also. I would actually probably think about investing in the first year itself, learn everything about it in the first year itself, and then I'd be much more comfortable to do clinical photography inside the patient's mouth in third year. Does that does that make more sense? So. What I'm trying to say is I will not insist, although it's the best thing to have the right equipment. Um, you can still do it with a phone if you want, but start as early as possible. But you need to know the technique and you need to have the right intro or accessories like cheek retractors, mirrors. These are not, not very expensive. But if you can buy it immediately in the first year, there's nothing better than that. I hope that answers the question. Yes, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Yep. The next question. Uh, 
for you asking the question. I guess. Mm. Uh, so another question. Uh, would there be another session for IDPC uh, next year? It happens every year. Uh, yeah. So 2022. Yeah. It's okay. going to happen. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. All right. So, um, can I proceed? Can I leave? Or um, this is the last time I'm asking. If there are any questions, uh, unmute yourself. Ask it so I can answer it. Otherwise, I'll be more than happy to go ahead and have dinner. Nothing else? Okay, then I'll probably call it a day. It was nice to be with you guys. Uh, I'll see you soon. Uh, do connect with me on Instagram or on Clubhouse. That's it from me, guys. Bye bye. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, guys.